investigators. This is the case break episode mini so the second that I've done like this this season. So welcome. And it's on the subject of Jed Match, which I thought was fitting because it's the subject of my Emmy nomination this week at the Television Academy. And I want to remind you that I have a special shout out to everyone who wrote reviews on Apple Podcasts. It really helps independent podcasts like this one get noticed. So subscribe, rate five star, and write a review if you can. After the episode, I'm going to share with you two true crime podcasts that I really like, and I think that you are too, Mens Rea and Light the Fright Podcasts. More on that after this episode. Investigators, you're on deadline. From the Hollywood Hills to your ear holes, this is True Crime Deadline Case Break. A minicast devoted to stupid criminals and other random facts that prove crime doesn't pay. Now, your host, a man who stands in front of crime scene tape and talks on the TV box for a living, Mr. Mystery himself, Matt Johnson, and his co-host for the day, someone who is already regretting this. My name is Colleen Fitzpatrick. I'm the founder of Modern Forensic Genealogy, the founder of Identifinders International, and the co-executive director of the DNA Dell Project. Investigators, Colleen is not seated next to me. I wish she was. She's here in spirit. She is a forensic genealogist who identified the Titanic baby who was identified all those years. Now, she has worked to identify dozens of suspects, killers, and victims. She runs two nonprofits out of her house, DNA Doe Project, which identifies unknown and unclaimed, and Identifinders, which is a mix of victims, killers, and unknown. She works with the FBI and police agencies around the globe. She has been a contestant on Jeopardy, believe it or not, and is an actual rocket scientist. In fact, she came up with the term forensic genealogy and wrote several books on the matter. Now, I read an article about Colleen, and I discovered that she didn't live too far from me. I'm in Beverly Hills. She's in the L.A. area. And I read about how she and her partner for her nonprofit, Margaret Press, are changing the way of crime fighting and finding the names of these John and Jane Doe's. Now, this is around the time the Golden State Killer suspect arrested, which is all over the news. And you know that that's using DNA and family tree lining up that suspect, which is the same method Colleen and Margaret used to solve cold cases. So I reached out, and Colleen and Margaret took a few minutes out of their crime-fighting day and were gracious enough to sit down with me. Check it out. Now, two retired California PhDs have teamed up with detectives. They spoke to our Matt Johnson for this. Colleen Fitzpatrick, a former NASA contractor and PhD in physics, is widely regarded as the founder of forensic genealogy. She now runs the DNA Doe Project out of her home in Orange County. So we'll have to organize the the volunteers on those cases. Co-founder Margaret Press, who has a PhD in linguistics, lives in Northern California. The two met on a social media site dedicated to genealogy. Through Facebook. Isn't that how everybody meets each other? Not long after, they decided to join forces and tackle some of the thousands of John and Jane Doe cases in the U.S. Colleen's connections to law enforcement presented the pair with their first lead, and the DNA Doe Project was born. We started out with John and Jane Doe simply because um, we thought it would be more acceptable to the genealogy community. Now that's a clip from a news report that I did here in town in LA, and it was about Jed Match. And in it, we explained the science and detective work of forensic genealogy by taking a case like the buckskin girl, named after the buckskin poncho jacket that she'd been wearing at the time of her death. In that case, Marcia King was found on the side of the road outside of Troy, Ohio in 1981. She had been strangled. She was just 21 years old. And for 37 years, she was a Jane Doe. Nobody knew who she was. Nobody claimed who she was. She was identified using a blood sample saved from when she was discovered. Her killer is still unknown today. Some believe that she was murdered by a serial killer who was targeting girls on highways. Girls who were blonde or had red hair like she did. 
but we still don't know. She was identified after Colleen and Margaret accepted the case, held a Doe Fund Me, which is a fundraiser for paying for the science and all of the work that is involved, and had a lab create a DNA profile. That was uploaded to GEDmatch, a public DNA database similar to 23andMe or Ancestry.com. And a few weeks ago, Colleen and I sat down to talk about how it all works. Take a listen. When we're talking about DNA and um, a possible serial killer or possible connection, is it surprising to you that the DNA sat on a shelf for, for more than a year? Uh, no, not at all, because, um, uh, you know, we come, we've dealt with DNA that's been on the shelf for 37 years or more. We just solved the case um, of Annie Lehman up in Oregon where it's 50 years old. So, you know, you can still do it. So um, how can a forensic genealogist like yourself really help in a case like this? Um, well, there's two answers to that. The first one is once you get the DNA process somehow, independent of how that is, and you get it up on GEDmatch, the genealogist knows how to look at the matches and the DNA cousins and work on those family trees and knit them together so you can find the person sitting in the nest of those trees. You know, he's got to be a second cousin to this guy and a first cousin to this guy. And all the, the cousins are Polish, so guess what? Your guy is probably Polish. You look at where they live. You know, you detect people that say there's illegitimacies in the family. You know how to find those. In other words, you won't keep building the tree. You'll realize, wait a minute, that branch is there's a different story. I've got to solve that mystery before I solve the mystery. You know, so it's intricate. And how much DNA do you re do you need in order to create a sample, in order to uh, do a test, and in order to build a tree? Uh, now, that's a good question because, um, you know, typically I'd say as much as you possibly can get. And blood usually works really well. We do a lot of bone extractions through DNA dough because we do skeletal remains. We've gone down to maybe single-digit nanograms, but we have different research programs where we're going even to picograms, which is a billionth of a gram. So, you know, the, the holy grail is to do DNA based on one cell. You know, in specialty labs, maybe can do that to some degree if it's good DNA. So the lower limit has never been determined. And the whole goal in the whole world right now is to do more and more with less and less. Okay. And wait, I said there were two ways that genetic genealogists can help. The second way, I told you the GED match in the bill. Well, actually, before that, getting the DNA in shape to go to the lab and do the magic and, you know, process it and get it to that stage. Um, they, Margaret and I are really good at that. We know that whole process because we had to figure it out on our own. We didn't have Bodie. We didn't have a big lab to tell us how to do it. We did it on our own. So genetic genealogists typically don't realize there's this whole story before you get to GEDmatch. And Margaret and I are really two of the top at figuring out how to get it to GEDmatch. You know, there are labs, there are people that are doing this and so on, but we really have solved a lot of problems. The, the big deal is the killers and, and suspect cases, the, the serial killers, that's pretty much DNA that's normally in good shape. So what's, and those labs don't have to think too hard on what they're doing as a rule. But we, because we had so many skeletal remains, we had to learn what to do to get the DNA out of those bones and make sure it's in good shape. And if it wasn't, how to repair it to get it down the line into GEDmatch. So that's the second question. There are very few people that know the answer to that second question. And then talk about some of the cases, you know, what kind of cases do you work on? Do you work on serial killer cases? Yes. I, in fact, um, we, uh, we are working on uh, a case. A lot of times DNA Doe will have the victim and I will do the killer. So, you know, we work on both sides, which is good. You need to know the victim before you can get to the killer. And it's funny, sometimes they don't know each other. You know, they're just random people that met on the street and one killed the other. So sometimes, but you really do need to know the victim. Now, there are serial killer cases where the guy knows he killed all these people. He just doesn't know who they are. And that's kind of interesting. So we get both sides of that story. Yeah, we work on serial killer cases, definitely. What, why does this kind of work speak to you so much? Like, why? It's, 
you know, human condition. It's who we are and why we are that way. It's a glimpse at the big picture, you know, what makes us tick. And not only solving it helps, but seeing the family and, you know, how they handle it, that that adds to that. Or, uh, you know, if you call, I know in one case, one of our, it turned out we figured out who a killer was and the genealogist uh, had to speak to her, his daughter about it. And she was cool. You know, she understood he died a while back. So she said, yeah, I, th- I thought so. I thought, you know, I, yeah. And she was cool with it. And then at the end she said, but he's still my dad. You never know with DNA, we, you know, Titanic baby, 80 years in the ground in Halifax, Nova Scotia, acid rain. You know, they got three baby teeth and a piece of bone, and one of those baby teeth had just enough DNA to make it happen. You never know. And I've heard of, you know, skeletal remains relatively fresh, nothing. So you never know. A lot of studies on that, but you never know. Awesome. Nice to see you, my friend. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I hope things are going well. So give me a buzz sometime. Hey, my people call your people. We'll do lunch. Now, since I first met Colleen, GEDmatch has changed its privacy policy in light of a BuzzFeed article that said that the company bent its rules to share data in a Utah case. In that case, a 17-year-old was arrested for a violent assault against an elderly woman. So now, when users upload their DNA, they must opt in to allow law enforcement to use that data. And by default, all users are set to opt out unless they go into the settings and opt in. So here's my PSA for you for the week. Please opt in. Now, as for the Emmys, I am taking my mom, Georgia, to the Emmys as my date. Best date ever, right? This is going to be the first time taking her to an award show. We're very excited. But I warned her, I am the Susan Lucci of local news Emmys. Yes, I've won in the past, but I've been nominated like a dozen times. So fingers crossed. Regardless, I am humbled and grateful to be recognized for the first time in L.A. in a town that created the Emmys. But regardless, this nomination is dedicated to Colleen and Margaret and the work that they do, the armchair detective work that they're doing right now. Investigators, after this episode, we have a shout out to those who wrote Apple reviews, and I'm going to tell you about two podcasts that I'm listening to. Until next time. Thank you for investigating True Crime Deadline Case Break with Matt Johnson. For more information about the podcast, visit truecrimedeadline.com. And please remember to subscribe, rate the podcast, and phone a friend. Until next time. Mr. Gatsby, want a cookie? Good boy. Now a post-episode shout out to the investigators who wrote reviews on Apple Podcasts. The first one is Sammy Darren, who says that they love my reporter perspective. Thank you. And the second one is Luke A, who calls it an excellent show. And we do try. And by we, I mean me and the crime-fighting canine, Mr. Gatsby. He's so cute. I digress. Uh, Again, it really helps independent podcasts like this one get noticed. It's easy. It's free. Hit the five star. Hit subscribe. Tell a friend. Write a review. (sighs) Include your real name and uh, your podcast. If you're a podcaster, I want to give you a proper shout out. And thank you. Um, So now I'm excited to tell you about a couple podcasts that I am listening to. The first one is Mens Rea. And then the second one, Light the Fright. You can find them on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, Google Play, anywhere you binge. We're there. We're waiting for you. Download us. Go find us right now. Um, So the first one that I'm going to tell you about is one that I'm subscribed to. It's called Light the Fright Podcast. And it's hosted by two friends self-described as Southern Bells, Miranda and Natalie, who talk about real life stuff and real fear which I can relate to on so many levels in so many episodes. Check it out. I'm Miranda. I'm Natalie. We may be fraidy cats, but we are perilously curious. No topic is off limits with us. We explore all forms of physical and metaphysical fears, from a primal fear of snakes, Miranda, haha, 
to the annoying fear of commitment. Oh, also Miranda. When are we going to talk about your <laughs> issues, Natalie? We analyze the nature and rationality of these phobias, and we face some of our own fears on the podcast. Except for snakes. That one's off limits. Oh, it's coming. But we do splash in some true crime stories and real life stories relating to those fears and phobias. If you follow these southern bells into hell, we promise to have you back in time for dinner. Join us on Light the Fright Podcast wherever you get your podcasts. You can find us on Twitter and Instagram at Light the Fright. And on Facebook at Light the Fright Podcast. So I was smiling when I was first listening to them tell a story about the fear of sinkholes. It's really funny, but I kind of get it. Now, the other podcast I want to tell you about is one that I'm obsessed with, Mens Rea, Unusual Crimes from Across the Pond. It's got a great tone, a great accent. I mean, listen to this. Mens Rea is the legal principle of criminal intent. It means literally the guilty mind. Join me, Sinead, every fortnight to discuss Ireland and the UK's most heinous crimes and the court cases that followed. Do you want to know more about a kink killing in Dublin in 2012? Or serial killers in Scotland? Whatever your guilty pleasure, you'll find it and all the details with me. Find Mens Rea wherever you get your podcasts.